All right, well, from the latest in AI trends, we're now going to be looking into the latest in quantum computing. Now, whereas AI has become something that we're often thinking about a lot more in our everyday lives and in business, quantum computing, maybe not something that most of you are talking about on a day-to-day -day basis, myself included. So at its simplest, it's a new way of processing information. These computers uh, can work much quicker than uh, standardized computers because of the physics involved. And our next guest is going to be here to explain a little bit more about how they work and how all of that can fit into the future direction of business and leadership. So please welcome Ines de Vesa, who is a VP of technology for the quantum computer company IQM. All right, good to have you here on the HSVZ stage. Let's just start by hearing a little bit about you and how you got involved in quantum computing. Yes, uh, well, it's very nice being here. Um, I was uh, basically starting to work in quantum computation, per se, back in 2020. And before that, I was a quantum, um, a quantum technology researcher. I was doing research at the university. And it was back then, around 2019, when the experiment of Google, where Google was showing what we call quantum supremacy, when the whole community that was working in quantum uh, started to realize that this actually has a very, um, a very uh, promising potential to impact, actually, industries. And that was the moment when I became very interested and then started in 2020. OK, so break it down for us, for those of us who aren't natural physicists. Why are these computers so special? Yes, so it's, uh, quantum computation is based on a completely different paradigm of computation. So, you know, in classical computers, you have bits uh, of information that can have values uh, either 0 or 1. But quantum computers can um, well, have qubits, quantum bits, that can actually live in a superposition between 0 and 1, which actually spans very significantly the space uh, of memory that quantum computers work with. And actually, the good thing about qubits is that they also um, can combine themselves in, in, in parallel and uh, therefore produce an, a parallelization that is not seen in classical computers. And the other property that quantum computers have is that qubits can actually get entangled, which means that actually when you change the state of a qubit here, you produce an instantaneous effect of another qubit any other way in the quantum computer. And these two properties, parallelization and entanglement, is what actually produces a very significant speed up in certain kinds of computational problems and also enables quantum computers to solve complex, uh, for instance, complex uh, materials and molecules in a much better way than classical computers. Mm. So a potentially very broad potential. Can you give us some examples of how this might be applied? Absolutely. So for instance, these parallelization properties, so the ability for the quantum computer to have, at the same time, many different states is very useful for optimization problems. So in optimization problems, you really want to look for the best solution of, uh, among a limited number of solutions. Like, for instance, when you want to understand how to distribute uh, goods within a network or how to arrange uh, the scheduling of planes. Um, so for these specific optimization problems, you really want um, to, to find the best possible solution. And this is what quantum computers do very well because of this superposition um, um, property of being able to really explore all the space of possible solutions simultaneously. And then the second kind of industries where I think quantum computers will produce a very strong impact is in those that are pretty much dependent on the ability of resolving complex materials, molecules, etc., like for instance, pharma and uh, bio biotechnology in general. So what kind of time frame are we looking at for seeing this, these applications coming to life? Yes, this is, of course, always the, 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 the one billion dollar question. Um, we are talking about the time frame where around in the next five to 10 years, we will begin to see what uh, is called quantum advantage. Quantum advantage means that we will start to show that for industrially relevant problems, quantum computers are more uh, efficient either in runtime or energy consumption or in precision than, than classical computers. So this is about the time scale in which we will start seeing these quantum solutions taking off. But I think it's after 10 years when we will start to see 
that these quantum solutions start to populate more the, the, the faces space of, of industry problems. Mm. Okay, so still quite a long, uh, a long term prognosis. Um, but where are we here in the Nordic and Baltic region? Do you feel that this is an area where we're getting ahead compared to other parts of the world? And which other parts of the world do we need to keep an eye on? Yes, that's a very good question. I would say um, here in Finland, where we are today located, um, we have very strong, um, on the one hand, groups doing quantum at the University of Alto, for instance. And we also have a number of companies, uh, like for instance, IQM, the company where I'm working, that are, for instance, um, leaders in, in, in the world uh, for, for producing quantum computers and also quantum algorithms. But we also have quantum algorithm companies uh, that are located here. Now, about industries that are starting to um, basically adopt this technology, I think this is going slower in general, not only in the Nordic area, but in general. So we are starting to see um, companies that are beginning to be quantum ready, meaning they are starting to explore how to actually introduce quantum solutions in the production of their, well, basically in the, in the pipeline of, of their uh, of their products, for instance. Mm. It's a difficult one because how do businesses know when the right time is to invest, particularly when we're coming off the back of rocky times for the economy? A lot of companies are already uh, investing heavily in AI, and now here comes another solution that, oh, actually, you need to keep your eye on that for the next decade. Yes, exactly. Uh, but in a, in a sense, there are fields, uh, industry areas that uh, are used to very long time scales, like, for instance, pharma and biotech, they are used to having time scales of, of more than 10 years to actually produce a drug. And uh, for those kind of industries, I think a quantum uh, or be, being quantum ready is already relevant because we, we do have now in, in many different quantum computing companies a roadmap that is very clear and uh, through which we know that uh, the time scale for actually having this quantum advantage that I was mentioning before is, uh, is already quite near, uh, relatively speaking as I said, for, for these kind of companies. Mm. We're starting to get some questions in from our audience. Thank you for those. Um, you mentioned the untangling process earlier, and this person wants to know, how can you control which qubits will entangle? Well, entanglement, the way it is produced in a quantum computer, is by making uh, qubits interact with each other by pairs. And uh, this is how, little by little, as you produce these gates that entangle pairs of qubits, you are building entanglement uh, potentially across the whole uh, quantum processing unit, across the whole quantum computing. So it's actually, as you can see, a very controlled process. Um, so it's, it's kind of a very interesting kind of system, because it's very complex on the one hand, but it's very controllable. So you, you are able to really understand when are you creating entanglement between two qubits by producing these gates, these interactions, and also when you start to make these two qubits interact with others, then the entanglement is growing among more and more qubits. Okay. Um, you also picked up on supply chain management being an area where um, quantum computing has the potential uh, to make an impact. Um, just tell us a little bit more about how that might work. Yes, so basically this, this is a kind of a model problem that uh, belongs to this class that I mentioned before of saying, okay, you have uh, a graph with uh, what you have, your problem is described as a, as a graph, as a network. And what you're looking at is uh, which one of the very many different configurations is the best one to, to solve your, your, your problem with, with some constraints. And uh, the reason why quantum is very good at this is exactly because you can build a quantum entanglement and superposition of all the qubits um, and uh, this kind of state that you are building in your quantum computer is representing at the same time all different possible solutions to your problem mm. so that your quantum algorithm is going to be able to identify among all these solutions that the quantum computer has been prepared in which one is the one that solves your optimization problem. And it's known mathematically that the quantum computer is going to be do this much faster, um, polynomially faster than, than a classical computer. Mm, OK, so a, potentially a really uh, efficient tool. Um, 
We've got some more questions coming in here. This one says, uh, it's a question about China's involvement in quantum computing. Um, it says, China's involvement has sped up during the past seven years in particular, and in 2040, they'll be the number one in the world, um, according to this source. How do you think Europe will be able to compete with that? You, is that an accurate reflection of, of where you see China? I love the question. It's, it's a, actually, it's a question that I also have, and I kind of have the answer. The answer is really by investing more. Because we know that, um, well, first of all, we know that classical computers are, are, are very impressive, but they are reaching their limits in terms of uh, energy consumption, so we know that AI is going to actually consume all the energy that is produced in the world in the next uh, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, so, and quantum computers have, um, in principle, the potential to, to solve this energy consumption problem. So this means that we really need to invest on alternative computational uh, technologies. But um, what is needed to compete with China is actually for investors to invest more and for governments to also uh, invest more in this technology mm. that we know we have a roadmap to produce, but uh, that is at the same time requiring a lot of investment. Mm. So we are talking about probably hundreds of millions of euros, uh, what is required to build this uh, quantum computing system that will produce the advantage in five to 10 years mm. that will enable quantum solutions to compete. And just finally, with any new tech, and a topic we'll also be touching on with our next guests, uh, with new tech comes questions about security and data protection. What are the key things that companies need to be thinking about if they're investing in quantum computing and concerned about how that might impact security? Yes, that, that's actually one of the questions that are always very interesting to, to address. Um, well, quantum computers, uh, we know that they would be able to, to crack uh, some of the most used codes in communications and, and for instance, in internet, uh, which is, um, for instance, the, the elliptic, um, elliptic code and RSA. And because those are based on the ability or basically the inability of, of classical computers to solve, uh, for instance, to factorize large numbers, or to calculate um, um, logarithmics, like discrete logarithmics, logarithms. Um, and we know that quantum computers uh, with the short algorithm and variations can actually um, solve these problems very easily, uh, very fast. But um, they will only be able to do that when we have tens of, maybe tens of thousands of what we call logical qubits, meaning qubits with very low error rates. Okay. And this will only come not in 10 years, but probably more around 10, 20 to 30 years. So we are a little bit far from this moment. Yeah, OK. So opportunities as well as risks. Uh, yes. Ines de Vega, thank you very much for joining us. We need to wrap things up there, but great to have you here at Nordic Business Forum. Thank you. <laughs>